Welcome to the Golden Shadow. My name is Aaron Rogerson. And I'm Melissa Polizzi. Today is our holiday special. We're talking about Christmas. Christmas, the holiday, the holiday season. What does it mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? I'm not really sure. And that's probably what this episode's about. The ritual of Christmas, it seems like a confused holiday to me. Ever since I was a child, I've always felt as like Christmas doesn't really make much sense to me, or it's trying to be something in my life and failing. And part of that has to do with the traditions that I think have sort of merged with more modern sensibilities, whether it be the consumerism of the presence or the kind of explosive, celebratory, loud Christmas songs blasting out of the stereo that my dad plays at Christmas. Um, I'm not sure what Christmas is. Mm. And maybe this episode is partially to explore where Christmas came from, maybe what it used to be, maybe what it should be. Mm. Um, But we don't really know because we're not like historians (laughs) and we're not even really Christian Exactly. Well, I'm Catholic. You're, well, yeah, and, I'm, <laughs> and I went to church for a while too, but uh, I just this is kind of an exploration of um, the Christmas phenomenon. Well, this is like part two of our holiday exploration, and maybe something that we'll keep doing when maybe holidays. Oh, you holidays. mean because we did Halloween? Yeah, yeah. I, I think both you and I have this deep interest and fascination with ritual and why humans do what they do, like Mm -hmm. the psychology behind things and recognizing that there's these massive cultural events that we have. And yet there seems to be both a, a deep commitment to them that people have, um, a deep sort of emotional connection Mm -hmm. yet at the same time, it lacks certain qualities that make it feel meaningful to some at least. Yeah. So what's going on and why do we feel as we do? What does it really mean? And What is the symbolism behind a lot of the things that we do? And I think with Christmas, I don't know if we want to start here, but it's so obviously close to the winter solstice Mm -hmm. that I think if you look kind of at at certain origins, you think that it might be this merging of more ancient um, practices and rituals around this changing of the season that was adopted um, as Christmas. Right. So if we go back far enough we can think of ancient peoples um really having natural occurrences as being kind of a calendar or Mm -hmm. cosmic events as being significant because there is nothing else there is no cultural Mm -hmm. structure perhaps that's telling you that today is special for some reason there's just sort of the uh, the um the changing of the stars the changing of the um, length of the day, the changing of the temperature, and these things, these seasonal changes would have had a serious effect on ancient peoples. And you can understand mm-hmm. why mm-hmm. this whole notion of like, oh, winter is coming would actually be a pretty significant aspect of reality mm-hmm. for them mm-hmm. because life was about survival back then. Yeah. And people who lived in seasonal areas, like in the north, mm-hmm. um, in Europe, um, winter was serious. And summer was a huge contrast. So you can understand why there would have been um, a lot of attention given to the changing of the seasons, to watching the stars, to watching how the sun moves. Mm. And we can understand the winter solstice as being the darkest day of the year. Yeah. The time when the days have gotten shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until they're finally at their shortest. And this is a time where you have to be extremely careful in those seasonal locations, right? Mm -hmm. Because food stores, how was the harvest season? Mm -hmm. How well equipped are you to go into the, to the months of winter into the, into that cold uh, time where the land is, is more barren and building a ritual around that passing of the season, marking it in some way, Mm -hmm. probably also giving certain sacrifices, making sure that things are stored properly is something that for survival, Mm -hmm. for the evolution of, uh, of the culture of the people had to be marked. It had to be important. 
definitely. Um, so I think a lot of festivals are associated with um, the harvest. I think it's kind of a universal thing in agrarian societies. This notion that you've um, spent a very long season gathering food, and now it's time to store it up. Mm-hmm. And there's a celebration often associated with the end of the harvest, and sometimes that's kind of like what Thanksgiving, I guess, it's sort of mm-hmm. around maybe. Um, harvest is over, time to feast, and then now it's time to prepare for winter. Mm. And then by the time it's winter solstice, you're kind of already into winter, even though you're not into the maybe the worst parts of winter yet. Depends where you live. But um, something else, something else, I think that's important to keep in mind is like the the power of light and dark to ancient peoples. I mean, we, we live in cities now; we have electricity, and the nighttime doesn't really mean darkness mm. in the way that it did in the past. And especially for people who live really far north, I mean, people who live in Alaska, for instance, have to deal with like serious darkness for a very long period of time. And it totally, totally affects their entire way of life. And like in Alaska, for instance, there's a, there's a whole culture that has um, evolved around this insane winter. Hmm. And that's like a big part of what it means to live in Alaska is to deal with the winter. And so yeah. you can understand in the past that like it would be even more intense, this idea of having to deal with winter. And the power of light and dark. The sun really was salvation. Yeah. And the darkness really represented cold and possibly death, danger. And um wasn't as simple as turning on a light nowadays. Yeah. It wasn't as simple as, you know, having uh, central heating and uh, being able to build a fire reliably. This mm-hmm. is, is something that it's really hard for us to fathom what it would have been like for people living thousands of years ago, but you can understand why this deep archetypal association with light and dark yeah. is, is pretty deeply ingrained within us. Yeah. And with, with that, you, you start to see in certain cultures around this time, this uh, celebration and ritual around the, the death and rebirth of certain deities that were, um, connected to the sun. Mm. So we're seeing the rebirth of the sun literally um, and having that take hold within the people's psyche so much so that they can create these myths and these stories from it. And you can then uh, raise up a kind of cultural story to say that a certain deity is being reborn at this time Mm -hmm. as the sun um, begins to grow um, more and more each day from, from the solstice and Interestingly, you start to see that connection a bit when we look at even how we celebrate Christmas nowadays, despite us not really celebrating the sun. Yeah. There's a, there's a deep connection there. Right. So this shortening of the days, and again, like this is something that people would have been paying attention to, mm-hmm. especially agrarian societies would have been paying attention to this. It's like the days are getting shorter. And it's not only that the winter solstice is like the darkest time of the year, but it's like it's the inflection point. Mm. where now the days are going to get longer. Mm -hmm. So there's like this dip. It gets shorter, 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 winter solstice, and suddenly the days are going to get longer. So there's not only this combination of like we're in it deep right now, we're in the Mm. darkest time now, but also like and hope now emerges, the return of the light. And so there's actual festivals. Um, Just for example, there's a lot of festivals around the world that – um, are celebrated at the winter solstice or around the winter solstice at least. And so some examples are, uh, and forgive me if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, but the uh, Donzi Festival is a winter festival that's celebrated in like China, Korea, and Japan. Maybe not everywhere in China, Korea, and Japan, but um, it's a winter solstice holiday and it can be traced back to sort of the yin and yang philosophy of, of balance and harmony in the cosmos sort of like a dance between light and dark um and the philosophical concept of the Danzi festival corresponds to um the chinese uh i ching i don't know if i'm even saying that right mm-hmm. the i ching the i ching mm-hmm. hexagram fu which means returning huh, or okay. the turning point so like this turning point is what this festival mm-hmm. is about mm-hmm. Um, this oscillation between dark and light, the yin and yang, it's like this cosmic balance. And the winter solstice is representing sort of like the yin becoming the yang. Mm, mm-hmm. um, and so again, that inflection, that turning point is present there. Um, Karuchun, 
again. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correct way. It's like a, a pagan Slavic holiday um, celebrating the winter solstice. Um, it's considered the day when the the black god and other spirits associated with decay and darkness were most potent. Mm. And Hors, who is the sun deity, grows older and weaker as the days get shorter mm. until he is ultimately defeated by dark and evil powers of the black god wow. on the night of the winter solstice. So like you're saying, it's a deity, it's a sun god, it's mm-hmm. a god of light, and he gets old and older and older, yeah. and eventually he's he can't hold back the darkness anymore, yeah. and he's defeated, he dies yeah. on the solstice. But with the morning, yeah. Wars is reborn yes. as the new sun, yeah. and he returns to defeat the darkness. So there's this death and rebirth mm. Also, light and dark, light being reborn. Yeah. That happens on the solstice. Mm. Um, let's see. Other neo-pagan celebrations like Yule mm. mm-hmm. or Disablot. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. But the end of the harvest, there's like a fire celebration, light. It's the new year. Um, Yalda in Iran mm. is like the darkest night. Um, I think people stay awake all night. Because it's like when evil is most present. Mm. Um, Magai is a Hindu festival which honors the sun. Um, Hogmanay in Scotland is like a feasting, fire, New Year celebration. Um, and so there's a lot of wintertime festivals that have a common theme of the harvest season or yeah. the yearly cycle coming to an end. Mm-hmm. And there's feasting with loved ones. There's remembering those who have died sometimes. Mm. Um but the theme of the world succumbing to darkness, yeah. followed by the rebirth of the sun. Yeah, it's deeply archetypal. Mm-hmm. You see it across cultures, as you're mentioning. And it's this way for, um, as I was kind of saying, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's some sort of manifestation of a material reality that's getting imprinted onto the collective psyche mm. and then manifesting in a way that people can understand it and pass it on and talk about it. Um, this isn't quite the same, but it, you're talking about like death and rebirth gods and it's yeah. reminding me of uh, Dionysus. And mm. I don't know if a lot of people... Um, often are taught this or learn about this, but because Dionysus was a god of the harvest and mostly like with the wine and and um, agriculture and things like that, yeah. with the withering of the season, there are these stories that emerged of him dying, actually being like torn to pieces, really weird, um, mm. but then being reborn again. And so you see that there are these really potent, powerful stories that get developed over time for people to understand the changes of the season or of the harvest. And we recognize that there's a withering of, of the grape, you know, it, mm. it slowly falls away. The yeah. plant falls apart, but in time, the new seeds are sowed and it's reborn again. Right. So these death and rebirth cycles, especially are prevalent all across um, mythologies all across the world and yeah. is a way for us to relate to some dynamic that we're experiencing in real life and to make mm-hmm. sense of it, right? It kind yeah. of goes back to like the religious um, function instinct episode that we did, which is we're trying to collectively uh, sense make. Mm-hmm. And so we'll create stories, narrative, really kind of getting in touch with that unconscious element. And then from that is born these um, magical stories, these myths. Mm-hmm. So we get to Christmas and um, Christmas it's kind of like an amalgamation of a lot of these themes, mm. right? There's mm-hmm. a lot of, there's like death and rebirth mm-hmm. with Christ. Yeah. Um, there is sort of the, the new world being born, the new year, mm. Christ is born and there's sort of like the world will be new. And now there's a turning point here. The, uh, the Kairos is something that I think is associated with the birth of Christ, which is Mm -hmm. like the history changes now. Um, But we can kind of stay focused on like the theme of light though for now. And so like Christ is symbolic of light entering the world at a a great time of darkness, Mm -hmm. similar to the themes we're just talking about. It's like the the time of great darkness, the time of great evil, um, the time when uh, dark spirits are most present and the uh, the light is weak, mm. and then the 
the solstice happens and then the light is born mm-hmm. into the world and Christ is sort of the birth of this light coming at a time of great darkness, coming when the world needs him. Mm. Um, and um, Christian churches have been built and are still being built um, as far as I know and as far as is possible with kind of an orientation so that the congregation uh, faces towards the sunrise in the east. Mm. Not sure how prevalent that is. Um, I almost kind of like want to think about the churches I'm familiar with mm. or we grew up. But facing east, fight, facing with the rising sun, the sun coming into the world. Um, this, is a, uh, this is from the Bible. This is Matthew 24, 27. Um, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the son of man be. So like the sun mm. of God rising in the yeah. east. It's like Christ is the sun, yeah. the S-U-N, but mm-hmm. also the S-O-N. Mm-hmm. Um, I, w- I wonder, I don't know if you know this, mm. but in in biblical texts, is he, how much reference is there with light, with the sun? Something that we see more often when Jesus is talked about. What do you mean? What are you asking me? Oh, I'm just curious of uh, that symbol of, of Jesus as the light mm-hmm. um, is, I mean, you always sort of see like the imagery, you know, of yeah. like the, the kind of halo, mm-hmm. the, the, that sort of sh- shining of enlightenment. Mm-hmm. But uh, curious if, if other places in the Bible talk about him as, as the light, as the coming of that, as the sun rising. Oh, yes. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so... Sunday, Christians worship on Sunday. That's a good point. The day of the sun. That's a very good point, yes. Coincidence? <laughs> I think not. I actually don't know if that's coincidence <laughs> or not, but... Um, um, anyways, uh, Christian saints are traditionally portrayed, as you said, with a halo of holy mm, light around yeah. their head. Um, Malachi 4, 2, which is basically the last passage of the Old Testament refers to the son of righteousness, S-U-N, the son of righteousness who will arise with healing in his wings. Ah, see, that's what I'm talking about. Right. Like how subtle that is. Right, right. So that's the end of the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because that's that's pre-Jesus. Like that's that's not written for Jesus. Right, but you you have that sense of, of... the, that symbol of the sun god already mm-hmm. there within mm-hmm. the the Christian lore, yeah, and and here we then have it continuing to manifest into the story of the son of God once Jesus is once he enters. Mm-hmm. So here's some more examples from the Bible um, in the Gospel of Luke one seventy eight. Christ's very advent is depicted as a visitation from the day spring on high mm. through the tender mercy of our God whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. And the word for day spring or day in the uh, original Greek is anatole, which means sunrise mm. or east. Um, and the solar imagery, the solar, excuse me, imagery continues in the New Testament. So mm. in John 1, 9, the true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. So this light coming into the world and it enlightens mm. people. So there's... Again, maybe we'll get into this a little bit more, but this connection between like vision and knowing and awareness and consciousness and yeah. light right. and Christ as being in some sense, it's like higher consciousness coming into the world in this, in this weird way. Um, so Jesus has logos? Jesus has logos, the word. Yes. All right. So John eight twelve. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Mm-hmm. And it's, this is so baked into our culture, our grammar of, of symbol and imagery that it's like, obviously we associate light with being good mm-hmm. and darkness with being bad. It seems sort of like um, self-evident, yeah. but it, that's not something that was consciously declared, I think, at this time that the Bible was written, mm-hmm. this notion of like light and dark. It's just yeah. sort of like this thing that we feel. And I mean, I, I think you can understand like why it would make sense just from an evolutionary viewpoint, like the, the power of light, the positivity of light. Mm-hmm. You can see like bugs fly towards the light. Yeah. You know, animals are drawn to the light. Humans are drawn towards the light and the sun represents warmth and growth and beauty. And well, without the sun, there's death. Right. You know, the plants mm-hmm. don't grow. 
what happens for people who who do live in those areas where yeah. you have a very short days. It, uh, there's that uh, association of depression mm-hmm. with the winter months. The sun is this life-giving, life-providing, energy-producing, uh, powerful manifestation of, of nature yeah. and reality. Mm-hmm. And so without it, there is no life. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, you're going to see this baked into the stories yeah. in in the in the literature mm-hmm. and also uh, something that we naturally want to create worship around. Yeah. All right, Matthew 17, 2, and he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun mm. and his garments became white as light. Mm. So that's the transfiguration of Jesus, okay. which is like a famous well-known uh, event of mm. Jesus rising into the air and glowing and shining this bright light. Mm. Um, okay. And then the book of revelation, and this gets like a little more intense and like heavy is um, revelation one, seven, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Mm-hmm. So again, come with the clouds, the sun yeah, of the clouds. Yeah, yeah. Revelation one sixteen. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth issued a sharp two edged sword, Whoa. and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Whoa, wait, swords? Two edged sword. <laughs> um from his mouth. Wow, that's really intense. In his right hand he <laughs> held seven stars. That sounds like a tarot. Yeah, I was just seven say. stars. Is there seven stars in a tarot, a tarot card? No. Well, no, no there's not. <laughs> Never mind. Um, two swords, though. Two edged sword. Yeah, that's so tight. One two edged sword. Okay. Which is like a normal sword. I see. Not like a double sword. Mm, okay. Or is it? I don't know. I don't okay. know. That's Again, I heard it. Uh, Revelation 22 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Mm, yeah. Which is in- interesting. Right, hold on, the and morning star. The morning star. And is, that's that's in contrast to the evening star, right? right. Which is Lucifer, is that? Uh, no. No? Wait, no, he's the morning star. It's Lucifer's a, it's the morning a, star? It's the star that you can still see as light is dawning, no? Hmm. The morning star. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I have it backwards right now. Anyways, okay, so Christ can be seen sort of as this light, right? Mm-hmm. The light entering the world in a great time of darkness. Yeah. So anyways, going back to Christmas, yes. which is the birth of Christ, uh, the celebration is symbolic of darkness, suffering, loss, and death, yeah. but also of hope yeah. of better things to come mm. in this new world, mm-hmm. in the new year, mm. as light returns to the world. Yeah. It's interesting that you're talking about that because mm-hmm. we see the um, the kind of continuation of that feeling of hope and renewal as the calendar year be- re-begins. And right. there's this feeling, there's like a shift in people that, that something can change. Things will be different. And I think we're, we might get into this in the new year and kind of yeah. do an episode on it. But still, it's it, it's very interesting because we have these modern versions of it. Mm-hmm. You know, we have our New Year's resolutions. Right. We feel like this year could be different for me. This year, I'll do this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to change this year. Right. And that deep sense of hope and shifting is tied to these holidays, to these rituals, and also to something really deep inside of our psyche that we just... Even though we've kind of secularized it, mm-hmm. it, it's still there. Right. Tomorrow I will be reborn. <laughs> and this ties. I don't know why you're laughing when I say that. Sorry. Just laughing at Arden. <laughs> no, you won't. Um, yeah, but yeah, tomorrow I will be reborn. And this, this actually ties into the last episode pretty well. It's like the elephant and the writer. Okay. It's like the writer is like, this year is going to be different. Yeah. Like, I'm going to change everything. <laughs> and the elephant is just like, no, like I'm not listening. I don't give a fuck like what you're saying. Like we're, we're not losing weight. We're not going to go on a diet. Like we're not going to start exercising. Like the, the elephant is like, does what it's going to do. But the mm. rider is like this year, this year will be change. Anyways, I'm mm. um, just trying to tie all the episodes together. <laughs> um, anyways, Christmas is also symbolic of the incarnation mm. of Christ. Mm. By which I mean the day that God became man okay. or heaven mm-hmm. joined with earth. Okay. So the incarnation isn't like um, like flesh, mm-hmm. like the divine became yeah. flesh and yeah. God became man. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
yes, incarnation it means to make into flesh. Hmm. Um, okay. And uh, this is interesting because this is so, so John, the Gospel of John one fourteen in the Cain James Version is, and the word mm. was made flesh. Mm. So there's the logos again, yeah, there's right? The, logos, yeah. the word, the word becomes flesh. Yeah. The logos becomes human. Mm. And it's like, well, what the, what does that mean? But we haven't gotten into that yet. No. But in Christian theology, the incarnation is the belief that Jesus Christ, also known as uh, God, the son, specifically, mm-hmm. S-O-N, mm-hmm. um, or the Logos, which is Greek for word, was made flesh. Yeah. And so heaven and earth come together, human and God come together. And there's this notion of a pre-existent divine thing being manifested in a human being. Mm-hmm. And what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. What is this pre-existent divine thing that becomes human? I think within each individual, there is a sense of the numinous. There's a sense of spirit of, um, like that kind of God that's in you. Mm -hmm. And there has to be some way that we kind of try to grapple with that deeply, uh, kind of spiritual, religious, higher consciousness tug that we feel inside of us. And so, Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jesus is the incarnation, but at the same time, by being human, we have a connection. Mm -hmm. God presides over us, and we feel God in our life, in our thoughts, in our actions, in the actions in the world. And I mean, I don't know what other people think the incarnation is, but just to me, that's kind of what strikes me is this feeling of of just making sense of that deep feeling of of, of numinosity Mm -hmm. that's within you and creating a story around it. And wanting to believe that God would choose to manifest in this reality materially for our uh, well-being. You know, Jesus, he died for our sins. You know, mm-hmm. he's here to save us. Mm-hmm. He's here to spread the word. And and we also see this, uh, you know, I'll pull in a, a bunch of Greek mythology. It's like, God, we see just like ma- the materialization of the gods all over the place. And every right. major Greek hero is a son of Zeus. It's like, and they are here to be the champions of Greece. Mm. They are here to, uh, to have, to show us glory, to, to be the, the person that we, um, aspire to be, mm. you know, Theseus, Hercules, these are, uh, these are sons of gods mm. and the sons of gods are people who have a certain demi-human quality to them that allows us to feel, uh, God incarnate, mm. So it's an, it's an interesting way that we try to make sense of that feeling of the religious function, I think. Right. So what we're getting is this sort of um, convergence of these different themes. It's like you have um, light mm. and then you have God becoming man and you have the word becoming flesh. And so there's kind of this overlap between light and the word, mm. which is essentially exploring these themes of vision or awareness or consciousness. Mm -hmm. So there is this idea of Christ being the birth of consciousness Mm. or an awakening of some kind or vision emerging into the world. Wisdom. Because Jesus was supposed to be a wise man, right? Right. He's he's speaking. He's speaking word. He's teaching. Um, And... You know, it makes you wonder, it's like, does this have anything to do with Christmas, actually? <laughs> does the logos have something to do with Christmas? Yeah. Are we still talking about Christmas? Yeah. Um, but that's part of the point, and that's part of what I was saying in the intro, is I feel that Christmas is this strange, confused holiday, mm. it, almost like it doesn't know what it actually is. Yeah. What is it about? Mm. Is it about any of this stuff that we're talking about right now? Mm. Or is it about family and mm. presents and food? Well, and yeah. uh, lights and Bing Crosby. Well, lights, right? There are these interesting symbols. Mm, Christmas lights. Christmas lights. Decorating the Christmas tree. Yeah. The- Jesus, Christmas tree, <laughs> logos. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that I, I I didn't realize that the the practice of having a Christmas tree is is relatively new. 
um, something that's only been around for, um, I think, only since like the 18th century or something like that. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Or it's like 17th or 18th century. Um, isn't it a pagan thing? Well, that's the thing. Well, okay, maybe not. Maybe not the tree itself, but isn't it sort of like bringing vegetation from the outside inside? Is that, isn't that kind of like a pagan? Oh, I'm sure. In many, thing? in many different like ways. Like I watched like a special on like Henry VIII having mm. a Christmas celebration where they like brought in all this vegetation into the house yeah i don't know if the tree was there though well the tree specifically like being brought in and decorated in this way Mm -hmm. uh this fairly new manifestation of of a ritual yet it's it's grabbed the uh the mind and uh the the spirit of of people for this holiday because the tree is like the centerpiece, right? Right. And uh, and when it lights up, you know, mm-hmm. it, and hopefully in a room of darkness, it becomes that beacon. Yeah. So we have this interesting symbol, especially the tree alone is such a, a potent, interesting, um, universal symbol, mm-hmm. often of knowledge, right? The tree of um, the tree of knowledge, the tree of life. It has all of this primordial energy to it, and we're uh, just decorating it with all of these. Um, interesting uh little ornaments tinsel lights and it becomes this interesting centerpiece with with the star at the top yeah i don't know it's hard it's hard to separate the symbols from the modern meaningless holiday Hmm. for me that's what's tough right it's like the christmas celebration feels kind of stupid to me in a lot of ways and, you know, I'm sorry to if, if I'm offending anyone who's listening um, who really <laughs> enjoys Christmas. That's I'm not I'm not trying to uh, talk down your uh, traditions or your celebrations, but this is just my personal personal experience with Christmas. Is just, it just feels kind of like a weird obligatory going through the motions holiday. Mm-hmm. And people, well, I don't care, whatever. It doesn't appear to me that people who I'm celebrating Christmas with actually enjoy it that much. Mm-hmm. It, it seems like they're just doing it because they have to. And to not do it, what would that mean? Well, I think, okay, you're bringing up a point that I think a lot of people can relate to is mm-hmm. that I think a lot of us feel like we're going through the motions. Yeah. And we're going through them and we're finding ourselves, you know, sometimes having fun, but other times just kind of like uh, oddly watching, you know, the weird family interactions or just mm-hmm. kind of like waiting it for it to be over and and it that sense of disconnection just comes from us losing um that sense of meaning of what this holiday is really about yeah. why do we do what we do mm-hmm. and what what does it bring us um and it feels if it feels like it's lacking why is that and how can we create deeper connection? And also like, you know, going to family parties and just not really doing anything that special except like opening presents and having dinner and then you're just kind of avoiding talking to everybody. It's yeah. just like, it, where's that sense of, of, of deep spiritualness that this time of year actually seems to encompass? And mm-hmm. I think that for me is what feels um, distasteful to it is I, it feels like it lacks a certain heart, at least right. for me. So going back to this uh, solstice celebration, to me, using that as sort of the foundation for this holiday, to me, it brings back meaning mm. into the experience. And uh, the question that kind of that I explore is what, what is the best way to actually ritualize the solstice? Because there is this feeling of like the darkness and this being like the darkest time of the year and light returning and... One way that I think is is powerful to think about it is, um, again, you, you know, you, you're talking about the New Year's resolution sort of as like being reborn, having a new year, having hope for change in the new year. But even now for people in 2020, I think there's been a lot of darkness in people's lives in so many ways. And there is sort of this feeling of hope that's emerged recently. Mm-hmm. That might be vaccinations, that might be the election Hmm. that might be um, the economy picking back up, hopefully. I don't even know what to say about that. Um, But there's an opportunity at Christmas to kind of embrace the darkness Hmm. and say, this is the darkest time of the year. Maybe it's a dark time in my life. Yeah. Um, 
But you can ritualize that by having a dark holiday. Don't have just like glaring lights and crazy music and explosive uh, drinking and dancing and feasting. Don't treat it necessarily like, uh, you know, like uh, pre New Year's Eve Mm -hmm. or something like that. Embrace it as a contemplative holiday. Embrace it as something where the lights go off and maybe, and I think this is the way that's celebrated in some ways that the Christmas is like, there's like one candle lit maybe in the darkness and you kind of really try to meditate on that one candle, that really tiny white. Mm. Think about how precious light is, how powerful um, light is in like a universe full of darkness, how powerful like the star for instance, is floating in space, floating in this infinite darkness mm. and how like all life comes from light. Yeah. Um, and if you can get into that space, it's a good starting place. I think it's a good foundational place to think about Christmas, to get into that meditative state, to get into that contemplative state and then maybe move on from there. Mm. If you're really embracing that, um, Christmas just becomes this much more emotional holiday this sort of like holiday about survival. Mm -hmm. And then maybe on top of that, you build into it the family, you build into it the feast um, and feel grateful for those as also like a source of light in your life. Mm. Um, The way the family can be a source of light, it can be sort of um, something that brings warmth and security into your life. The way that uh, food can be something that brings warmth and security into your life and how grateful you are to have that light shining in the darkness. Um, and that's where I think Christmas started. <laughs> that's that's the origins of the uh, the celebration of light, the celebration of the um, turning point in the world. And I think that that's what's really really interesting to think about is to kind of return to that place for Christmas. In lieu of a dream this week, we're going to go over some typical symbols of Christmas time. So we thought we'd start out with Santa Claus and maybe bring it back to the origins of St. Nicholas, who was an early Christian bishop of Greek descent. And his story, unlike the historical side of things, seems rather um, blurry. There's not actual a lot of historical details about him, mm. but there is this very interesting folktale and myth that arised from this um, individual who was a patron saint of sailors and merchants and thieves and prostitutes and children, like just the whole, ran the whole gamut. Mm. And he, he effectively became known for these secret gift giving explorations that he would go on yearly. And, you know, there was, um, the, a, a poor, um, neighbor who had three daughters and he didn't have enough money for their dowries. But every year when the daughters became of age, suddenly there was a bag of gold. And finally, one year he went out and he caught the person who was leaving this money. And it was St. Nicholas, like the local bishop. Mm. And this idea of coming in and giving back to someone who'd probably been uh, a good person, you know, who deserved it, but you just didn't have the means, mm-hmm. um, became built into this story um, that eventually turned into that traditional model of Santa Claus. Yeah, and now it's become what exactly? <laughs> so it's, it's still a myth. It's still a myth. It's still a story. It's still a man. It's kind of more like a <laughs> meme now than it is a myth. I mean, mm. was there really a difference between memes and myths? Um, yeah, I mean, Santa Claus nowadays, I feel like, is... Uh, he's kind of like a play on God. Mm. I'm not sure if other people would describe it that way, but I, like, I find yes. it interesting because it's like Santa's like, he's, he's watching you. Yeah. He knows if you've been bad or good. Yes. Like he knows if you've sinned or not. Yeah. And you're going to pay for your sins. Mm. You're going to pay for it. Like by not getting gifts. Yeah. Same as God. God is watching. And if you're virtuous, you'll, you'll be giving gifts. Yeah. Reality will work out for you. If right. you stay on the virtual path, whereas mm. if you sin, if you miss your mark, if you've been naughty, you're going to get in trouble. You're getting and a bag of coal. Yeah. And so it's like, that's like, <laughs> that's like what the Christian God 
where the Abrahamic yes. God essentially is, is he's sort of like a moral um, yes. structure yes. to, it's like a moral, it's a cultural moral structure mm-hmm. that helps mm-hmm. uh, you stay on the right path. And it's like God light or something for mm-hmm. children. Yes. It's something for children to believe in, to model themselves after, and to, if you tell a kid, you know, if you're good this year, you're going to get that toy. And that's Mm -hmm. something that they can understand. You know, it's like, eh, be good for this and that and fall in line. It's like, you have to appeal to the heart and the spirit of a child. Mm -hmm. And the, the story of Santa Claus is being able to receive this type of reward. um, I think it's just something that kids go crazy for. I mean, obviously, right? Like you just have this feeling of magic. I think that's the best word I could use for me as a child. It was just like this sense of awe that, I don't know. I don't even remember when I stopped believing in Santa Claus, to be honest with you, but I can tell you that I could, I I can still like close my eyes and feel the magic. Like, (laughs) Yeah. There's just something uh, children need these stories. And I mean, honestly, adults need these stories too. They just, their versions of them, but there's something that's just so important to the, to the fabric of life to have these kinds of stories and to feel like that nervousness when you're going to sleep on Christmas Eve, right? I don't know. Like I felt that and, and it's something that gave me energy and it's something that gave that time of year a meaning. And obviously I was probably like just obsessed with toys, but obviously mm. it also, at least for me, had something uh, a little bit more deep and intricate and interesting about it. It wasn't just toys. It was, it was magic also. Why do you think that magic's important for kids? Because uh, it fuels imagination because it, it enlivens the spirit. It's that whatever that deep quality of imaginal narrative dynamic is in in the human psyche like children are just wrapped in it and they feel this deep sense of of wonder and potential in the world and stories are real and and i think that's just something that's so nourishing to to people i don't even want to say children i think i think people adults i mean need it too but don't you think it's crushing when children find out it's not real? Yeah, And then but... they no longer trust you ever again or trust any <laughs> stories and they become incredibly cynical and they say, well, oh, I guess... Is that, that your story, The Orion? world's just like a bunch of bullshit, I guess. Like, <laughs> Santa's not actually real. Like, fuck you, mom and dad. Why'd you uh, lie to me? Um, don't you think maybe that's an effect? Um, yes, I do. And I acknowledge that and I hear that. And I think that's probably a lot of people's experience. That's why I said, I don't even remember, like, when I stopped believing in Santa Claus, which makes me feel like there was probably just a natural progression of it for me. Like mm-hmm. I just kind of got older and it was just like, oh yeah. But to be honest, when I stopped believing in Santa Claus, I probably had other magical stories that I believed in. So I think that's just... Still do. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, tell me a little bit about your experience. Is that what you're saying? Like it, like the, the curtain was lifted and it was like you no, saw the wizard I'm, behind. I'm, I'm joking <laughs> a little bit about that effect. I mean, I mean, it's, this is, I say this way too often. But it's like this, we could, we could do a different episode on this topic because it's too big to explore right now. Okay. But the whole idea of children telling children's stories and the utility of that, mm-hmm. I think it's sort of an interesting question. Mm-hmm. And I know that people kind of put forward this argument of like, it's important to like keep the magic in life and children. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah. Kind of, but like they shouldn't be lied to, should they? It's like there should be a difference between lying to them and actually, uh, uh, yeah, uh, c- encouraging creative uh, engagement with reality. And there's a difference there, right? Yes. Um, yes, it's true. You have to walk fine balance because even the stories at Sunday school at a certain point feel like bullshit, <laughs> and you're just like, uh, what's going on here? Because there's there's it's either that we live in a reality where like these stories just don't fit anymore Mm -hmm. because everything is, it's, it's, it's been stripped of a lot of that, you know, when we think about maybe how older societies certain tribes might have acted, what these stories did, what role they played. Mm -hmm. We don't need that quote unquote anymore. And so they, they feel out of sorts with material reality with the world that we live in. But I think they play a very important role and maybe it's the act of giving those stories and having that magic, but at the same time, not letting it 
I don't know, go too far. It's like Santa's real, but he's not real. I don't know. How do you have that conversation with a child? You can't exactly. No. But mythology serves as a heuristic, the same as metaphors. Yes. They're information-packed um, memes, essentially. They're mm. units. They're little uh, uh, pills you can swallow to gain a great deal of information in a short amount of time. And that's what a lot of uh, stories, the purpose they serve is to kind of teach a lesson that you cannot teach by explaining it literally. Mm. Um, yes. So. Okay, Santa so, Claus. Yeah. yeah is, is that a heuristic? We're <laughs> teaching children uh, how to be good and virtuous and then it will pay off later in life. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I believe that. But, yes. Uh, we can move on. Um, we got Krampus. Krampus. I don't really know much about Krampus. Yeah, to, to be honest, it's not really something I was very aware of for like a while. And then I was at this uh, work convention thing. It's going to yeah. sound really weird. And this guy in a full on realistic Krampus suit came in and I was blown away. Do you guys know what Krampus looks like? If not, pull out your phone, Google Krampus with a K and you'll be amazed. It's like this horned God. It's not. He's not a God. He's like a beast. He's this mystical, scary, intense character who suppo supposedly actually like hangs out with St. Nicholas and like helps him out, but he's freaky really? looking. Yeah, that's what it says. Hmm. He assists St. Nick and uh, he scares children who have misbehaved. It's got really old origins, of course, something like this. It's got like pre-Christian <laughs> Alpine traditions. It's like you seriously look up Krampus. Right, he's so crazy. It, if you haven't looked him up or you can't, let's say he's like a, like a goat god. Yeah, like look kind. at it here. I'm going to show you. Okay, so well, he, that, that just makes him look like Satan, basically. <laughs> no, right? He he's does. Not, he's not supposed to be Satan. Um, exactly. He's like a no. beast. He's like a horned beast. Horned beast. And he does the, feet. Doesn't he do the opposite of what Santa tongue. does? He puts children in a basket. Right, he's got this it's big, like, giving phallic uh, gifts. Uh, what do you call it? He's a big phallic um, one. <laughs> He has this birch like wand and oh. he like wax people with it or something. Oh, like a cudgel. Um, yeah, yeah. And he's got a basket and chains. It's honestly like it's a, it's really intense, but very interesting. And you're saying he he works with Santa <laughs> or like know. they're kind of friends or something like that? Or like um K Krampus is part of like the he's part of, cinematic universe he's part of, of, of Santa Claus. <laughs> like he's part of the crew. Okay. Right. They have their own movies, but yes. occasionally they have crossover movies. Um, you know, <laughs> you, I, I cannot say that I'm authority on Krampus, but from my understanding, he is sometimes part of the crew that comes around Christmas time, including St. Nicholas and possibly even Santa Claus and some other dude named <laughs> Dead Miraz. Like, just Wait, look. St. Nicholas and Santa Claus being two different yes. people? <laughs> <laughs> because it's it's like it's like Iron Man and War Machine, right? Um, it's like they're both of. like the same kind of robot, but like yes. War Machine is yes. uh, more. It's uh, you know heavy firepower. When you're in the realm of mythology and yeah. folklore, you have mm -hmm. to recognize that everything is incredibly blurry, yeah. and certain gods, symbols, whatever, they split and become two, and yet they exist uh, in opposition to each other, and yet they're the same thing. Or you have, like, the Titan Cronus, or you have, like, the manifestation of the god of time, um, Father Time, but that's actually, like, a manifestation of the Titan Cronus, who was a god of time right. and the harvest, and it's like, who's who, and what's what? Are they actually the same thing? Yes, but also they're different. There's Father Time, and there's the Titan. So it's it's right. it's like that when we deal with the, this kind the, of stuff. The interweaving of cultural memes yes. of... of yes mental entities you might say there's like an interweaving but there's also a differentiation of them and that kind of actually shows you how the mind works sort of and how culture works how culture evolves yes is that um one meme evolves and becomes a new meme mm -hmm. and it's not like there's actually a structure or rules yes. or like someone saying like well you can't have both saint nick and Santa Claus, yes. like that doesn't really fit. It's like, no, it's like there's no rules here except yes. like what the mind, what the unconscious is going to put forward yes. and spread mm -hmm. throughout the culture. Yes. So Krampus basically seems really similar to these figures like mm. St. Nicholas or Santa Claus, all the same person. Krampus effectively comes by and he'll give modest gifts to children who have been good, like mm -hmm. walnuts and chocolate, cool stuff like that, or yeah, to bad ones. Okay. I think it's cool. Are you going to say it wasn't cool? No. <laughs> I'm going to say that's cool. Okay. 
<laughs> um, and to the bad ones, he's got that birch rod, right? He's going to whack you with it. Or I don't right. know, there was like photos of him putting kids in baskets. It's, right, he takes you away. He takes you away. Right. Um, so, okay, let's look at that. <laughs> let's, uh, in our minds, imagine yep. Santa Claus, jolly, fat. He's got a bunch of cool little elves. They're all right. making toys. you got right. the North Pole. It's so awesome. And then you've got Krampus, scary, dark, monstrous. He's got a bird trot. He's going to whack you with it. Yep. He's going to give you just like a walnut for Christmas. We have very early pre-Christian manifestation of uh, the gift-giving God. And then you have like... <laughs> <laughs> the 20th, 21st century version of it. Very different images. Wait, Krampus is pre-Christian? Yeah, it's pre-Christian. It's got like, it's like an old Alpine oh, um, okay. tradition. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New oh Testament. Oh my God, so we've got like Yahweh and... Right, so Saint, Ni- Saint Nicholas is the God of the New Testament who's all about love. Ah, like, okay, he's like, okay, He's like okay. the judger. Yeah, like yeah. There's judgment that comes from mm-hmm. the God of the New Testament, but it's mostly the God of love and there's... Whereas the, the God of the Old Testament is like way more brutal, way more <laughs> it's dark. true. He's just like smiting people left and right. He's going like, to whack you with his birch rod. blowing up towns like when he feels like it just yeah. to like teach a lesson. Poor Job. Poor Job. And uh, so Krampus is kind of like the crueler, yes. more um, unforgiving and yes. brutal like lesson teacher. Yes. It's like, oh, kids have been bad. Okay, into the basket. You're never seen again. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's going to freak a kid out. Whereas like St. Nick is like, you're going to get cool. It's like, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. But, like, but, but St. Nick still loves you. Right. You're still going to get like a little toy engine under the tree, even yeah. if you've been bad. There's yeah, that feeling. And so so you know which god would you rather? Sorry, not which god. Which uh, what do you even call it? Um, which I which don't know. Christmas superhero would you rather have? <laughs> would you rather have Saint Nick or would you have Krampus? The the in, average individual would rather have Saint Nick because they want the god of love. Yeah. But which god uh, actually uh, is more effective and efficient at getting you to be virtuous? <laughs> it's like Krampus, the god of the Old Testament. Look, Krampus, I got to say, has, like, I see, like, a picture of a Santa or, like, a dude dressed like Santa. I'm just like, yep. eh, lame. And then I see a Krampus, and I'm like, oh, my God, it's so metal. Like, it's it's so cool. It's so oh, real. Well, this is really in the metal. Um, no, well, listen to well, our episode yeah, to on music. music. <laughs> just, oh, it's all about metal because Alyssa loves it so much. Oh, God. Anyways, um. Look, I really like that point you brought up. Mm-hmm. I, I I have to say that I think that we can look at that extremely old tradition that yeah. Krampus manifests from, and it was a harsher time. Mm. The same thing as we see in older stories where there's this intense way of gods, of creatures, of how they act in these stories, of what they manifest as, and that's a reflection of reality as we were kind of touching upon Yep. Something we'll have to do in a future episode, probably about like what God is, but like as these 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 psychic manifestations of, yeah. of reality. And so mm. we have Krampus, you know, who's pre-Christian. This is extremely old. Mm. And life was extremely difficult back then. Yeah. And the way that those types of um, images, those symbols would have manifested is so different than how... Uh, they manifest now. Imagine mm-hmm. if we had Krampus like coming out. Like you think kids in 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 twenty twenty would be into Krampus? Like they oh might my... be. I don't know. Kids are so cynical and dark <laughs> these days. You know, that's that's a good point. <laughs> and, uh, they see reality as being like this meaningless black hole of death. And <laughs> so what what resonates? I mean, like little kids. You know. Well, I mean, <laughs> I think the nihilism is getting earlier and earlier. earlier and yeah. Well. You know, point. What, do, what do kids like listening to? It's like they listen to like... Death metal? Uh, well, I don't know what kids listen to nowadays, honestly. But when I was a kid, like you might be listening to like corn and smashing pumpkins and just like darkness. Mm. I don't even know. Um, what about some other symbols? What's up with red? Why red on Christmas? Why does Santa Claus wear red? Candy canes, red and white. Yeah. What's the deal with that? I don't know. Red is just like, I guess, yeah, this universal, like, bright, warm. Cranberries. Yeah. The red and green. Red and green dynamic. I don't know. Lifeblood. Um, Blood. Energy. And, yeah. Life yeah. like that. I don't know. I honestly don't think I've seen a lot of information about that, but when I just think about what a potent 
powerful color red is mm-hmm. in the bleakness of winter. In, yeah, I think in, that's in, yeah, that's it. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Sort of like uh, in contrast to the white yeah. and bleakness right. and emptiness of winter, yeah. red and green are both potent symbols of life and right. uh, death. No, not death, sorry. Life, death. life <laughs> and warmth and um, food okay. and... You know, green also as the representation of the trees that you bring in are, mm-hmm. are evergreen trees, right? right? So there is this symbol of eternal life or something at least that is surviving through the darkness of winter, through the yeah. changing of the seasons. And so yeah. that that vibrancy of, of, of the plant, of trees, um, of the wreaths that you bring in, the branches, yeah. that is the reminder maybe, yeah. um, as we said, the contrast to that bleakness, the whiteness of the snow, the dreariness, the cold that you feel it brings. Because color is powerful. Yeah. Not only is it a symbol, but it's like something that you react to viscerally. Yeah. You like walk into a house and it was like painted all red, like all the walls are like, oh my God. <laughs> like, oh. You're really jarring. Yeah. It's not in a good way, but just like, oh man, like it does something to you. Color is very um, sure. interesting in that way. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. The more we more we talk about this, the more like weird I feel like Christmas actually is. Like I start to kind of just like think like, what the fuck? Like, what's up with like Rudolph and like, and you, then you have like Frosty the Snowman and like Jack Frost, and you start to get into like um, all these. Jack like, Frost is like creepy, right? He's like the wow. like the weird version of of um, Frosty the Snowman, isn't he? Is he? Oh. Is, he, is he evil? I feel like he's kind Isn't of like... Isn't there a horror movie about Jack Frost? Or am oh, I just I'm making sure that there, There's a horror movie about <laughs> Rudolph, probably. Like, it's like Benji. Not Benji, Cujo. The oh, cured Cujo dog. the dog? But it's just like a rabid reindeer or something like that. Anyways. Um, but Jack Frost, I think, is like a, kind of like a low-key character. Mm. Sort of like a mischievous entity that yeah. goes around like freezing things. But... I, I feel like the reindeers... <laughs> They've got to have some sort of interesting like folklore origin to them. They just strike me as that the image of them, the way that they act. Like how yeah. you know, how did Santa Claus get the elves? How did he get the reindeer? And yeah, the elves too. <clears throat> like, like Santa just has like these like little dwarves that like work for him. Yeah. Wait. Hold on. Before we move on to dwarves, can I just say that as an Italian that we celebrate Dominic the Christmas donkey. And if anyone's <laughs> listening, I know you're going to laugh. It was my favorite song. Well, that and Grandma got ran over by a reindeer when I was a kid. But anyways, I don't know why Italians. Dominic the Christmas donkey. Yeah. Jiggity, jinky, honky, honk. It's Dominic the donkey. I can't even say it. It's so funny. Is this? Jiggity, jinky, honky, honk. The Italian no, Christmas like, donkey. Should I know what this is? Is this actually no, widespread? I just, or I'm is just, just like one, a Sicilian or Stone Island it's an thing? Ita- no, it's, well, it's very Italian-American. I'm sure I don't think actual Italian people <laughs> celebrate Dominic. Dominic the donkey, I'm but it's donkey. really big for us Italian Americans. So I just kind of, <laughs> he's got a song. I don't even know what else there really is to Dominic the donkey other than like, he's a donkey. And that made me think of the reindeers and, uh, their yeah. animals that are, well, reindeers, especially something you associate a little bit more with winter. Of course. Um, I mean, they're just like Nordic. Right. They're Nordic. Creatures. And so this whole, that's, that's part of the again, like mimetic grammar of Christmas is like exploring like all the aesthetics of the North and exploring mm. all the aesthetics of the the snowy land, the place where yes. it snows. Um, and that's blending in with like Christianity in this weird way. Mm. And then like, it's almost like it's having like babies, like it's like breeding from inter- interweaving with one another and like mm. giving birth to like these strange new myths and memes. Yeah. Um, but it's, I mean, you know, it's playing on something that's in the unconscious, that's in the collective unconscious that people feel. Yeah. And that's, again, kind of like, it it just makes you wonder about all the holidays. Yeah. They almost serve these like interesting like niches Mm -hmm. for our psychology. Yes. Halloween's as we already covered, that kind of serves like this niche of like being like the shadow holiday, the dark holiday, the holiday where you, well, you try to manifest as your evil side or the hidden anti, side yeah. the anti or whatever that aesthetic brings up within you and christmas is occupying some other aesthetic that has something to do with uh being safe and warm and cozy someplace where it's cold outside and family's getting together and there's like a mm-hmm. feast 
And what's all this strange, <laughs> weird, like monsters and creatures and superheroes <laughs> that go with that? And donkeys. And donkeys. <laughs> um, there was a deep archetypal need in the psyche, you know? Yeah. There's, um, I heard something interesting. I was reading it and... And, and Jung kind of called it like the appetites, like like the archetypes. It's this deep appetite within the human psyche. And mm. and if it's not fed, it starts to like call out louder, like the hunger pangs, they get more painful and louder mm. and louder. And then so you, the manifestation will happen. Yeah. And so you have like maybe old pagan origins of using trees in certain celebration and then it's not in popular culture or mainstream culture and then boom, it comes back and then it's it's everywhere. It's in everybody's house at Christmas and it's like, why? Yeah. It's like there's this deep, 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 deep archetypal need to like worship right. the tree, to worship the light, to to mark the changing of the season, to celebrate the donkey or the reindeer. You know? Right, right. And it's, like, it's not arbitrary either. No. Like you couldn't replace the tree with some other object and be like, oh, it'll work exactly the same as the Christmas tree. No, there's, like, there's mm. particular ones that are like a puzzle piece. Right. It fits. And maybe there are similar, similar symbols that you can kind of maybe swap out, but really like something like that, like the tree, mm -hmm. that's something that's kind of meant to be. It's meant to come back. It's meant to manifest. It's meant to be here at this time of year. Yeah. I mean, the tree is very powerful yeah. and very deep within us. It's it's certainly a nature thing to kind of have some sort of correspondence with the tree as living creatures. Mm. The majesty of the tree, the power of the tree. Um, and this is something you have to think about with all the Christmas memes, all the Christmas celebrations, all the traditions. It's these things evolve to fill, as you're saying, sort of like to satiate this mm. appetite. Yeah, and You have to think, what is that appetite? Where does it come from? How does it contrast with all the other holidays? Yeah. So, you know, for the upcoming holiday, which should be a few days after you guys listen to this, if you do the first day it's released, you know, it, it's an invitation to think about the symbols that you surround yourself with of, of what you're engaging in when you enter into the holiday season. And also... It, to, to invite something in if it feels like it's missing and to maybe bring in a new symbol if what is around doesn't feel like it fits, you know, there's, there's other ways to bring in something that feels meaningful to you here. Um, or just to cultivate a sense of contemplative, um, mindfulness and presentness to this time of year. Yeah. Take ownership of the holiday. It's one of the, one of these, these obligatory celebrations where you're just kind of going through the motions. It's like, you don't own these celebrations, they own you mm. if that's what's happening. Yeah. So it's like, it doesn't mean just throw out the tradition. It doesn't mean like take Christmas and destroy it mm -hmm. and rebuild your own holiday that's <laughs> yours. It's like, if you want to, but like there's such a rich fabric deep within that that you can discover if you wish to explore it. And by discovering it, by exploring it, you make it your own. Mm -hmm. And there might be aspects that you throw out, that you shave off and you say, you know what? I don't really want to play Bing Crosby at Christmas anymore. I don't. I don't really like find this to be that meaningful for me. I'm not gonna do that anymore. In fact, I'm gonna embrace the silence of Christmas. That's meaningful to me. Take ownership over it, and that's it can be applied to all areas of your life. You know, why are you doing what you're doing? Are you are you going through the motions? Are you doing something obligatory? Are you wearing something because you're supposed to wear it? You know, that doesn't mean rip it all out destroy all of it it means like just be mindful pay attention to these traditions where do they come from what do they mean and how can you make them mean something to you do you have a question for us do you have a dream you'd like us to analyze is there a topic you'd like us to cover we want to hear from you contact us through a submission form which can be found at our instagram page at golden shadow podcast or if you're listening on youtube you can find the link in the description down below Thanks for listening. See you later. If you find this podcast useful, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash golden shadow podcast. Thank you.